All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Greenwashing and Factory Farm Biogas in Delaware. We're going to get started in just a minute with our expert panel here. I'm Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch. I want to give folks just a chance to hop on as we get our Facebook Live ready, and we are joining you on Zoom as well. So we'll wait just one minute. If you are at a computer, we do recommend you click the link to join the video because we're here. We're also, again, live streaming on Facebook, so you can join us there at our Food and Water Watch Facebook. I will also be emailing around the recording to everyone who signed up, so you will get that there as well. Looks like we have a lot of folks on, a lot of folks on Facebook too. So let's dive in. We have a lot to cover. Tonight, we're having a conversation about greenwashing and factory farm biogas in Delaware. I'll be moderating this panel of experts and asking questions that folks wrote in when they signed up. Groups from across the region, groups fighting similar projects across the country, and residents, concerned residents of Delaware, all RSVP'd for this event tonight. So we're streaming, streaming live to our national page because we need to shine a lot of light on this issue and because what happens in Delaware has implications for biogas build out across the country. So let me explain. Our panelists are here to give you a full picture of what's happening, but here's a quick overview. Right now in Delaware and across the country, gas companies and agribusiness are joining forces to try to sell us, quite frankly, a greenwashed nightmare. They're using resources like the air we breathe and the water we drink to squeeze profits out of the massive amounts of waste that they generate. They're selling this renewable energy future, but in reality, they're entrenching systems they create to increase profits at the expense of communities, systems like factory farms, pipelines, gas, and massive manure and litter digesters. So tonight, I'm joined by a panel of experts to talk about and focus on a proposed facility in Sussex County, Delaware. Specifically, why factory farm biogas is a false solution and why it won't address either our climate crisis, our water pollution problems, or, or our intensifying factory farm problems. So briefly, this company, Bioenergy Devco, is proposing a massive factory farm biogas scheme on the site of a failed chicken waste composting facility. And county officials and the company tried to skirt proper public engagement at the end of last year. Why? Well, we think that they know that this project is a public health and environmental disaster for residents. To feed the massive digesters at this industrial facility, the company Purdue Farms, again a behemoth in the region, has also promised to supply chicken waste to this proposed facility for the next 20 years. So with that, I'm going to kick things off with some introductions and then I'll pass it off to our panelists for tonight. They'll cover many topics and they'll be bringing us through all of these problems and into some solutions. So I wanna note that our fierce local advocate and speaker Gina Burton could not be with us here tonight, but our big team here is all thinking of her. And our panelists here are ready to set, shed some light on this proposal. First, we have Carrie Evelyn Harris. In 2018, veteran, activist, community advocate, and organizer, Carrie Evelyn Harris, transformed and invigorated the race for the United States Senate in the state of Delaware. Carrie continues her work within the state of Delaware and nationwide as she feels it is her duty to fight for and improve the lives of her fellow Americans. So building coalitions and promoting people-centered policies like what we're gonna talk about is part of her personal mission. We also have Tyler Lobdell. Tyler joined Food and Water Watch's legal team as a staff attorney in 2019 and focuses on combating factory farms through the legal system. Prior to joining Food and Water Watch, Tyler also spent two years working on food policy and litigation to protect consumers from false advertising. He's a longtime environmentalist, and he also spent 10 years leading conservation programs across the US before attending law school. And finally, we have Maria Payan. Maria is the senior regional representative at the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project, and she's worked four years to educate and advocate for socially responsible agriculture through forums, films, community events, and my favorite, after school programs for children. Maria has been instrumental in working within communities to fight the expansion of industrial facilities throughout Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. 
He's committed to keeping independent farmers viable while striving to preserve our natural resources. She's also formed strong coalitions to empower rural communities, especially those that are most vulnerable. Now this is a panel, so I'm going to encourage my experts to add and engage with each other's points. There were a lot of questions, but each of these panelists really know their stuff. So I'm excited for you all to hear from them. So I'm gonna start big picture with each of you. And before we dive into the specific project, um, I'm gonna ask you each a question to help set the stage for the discussion tonight. So Tyler, I'm gonna start with you. Give us the context on the connection between bioenergy and Purdue, this Purdue scheme in Delaware and greenwashing. Tyler, the title of the webinar is Greenwashing and Factory Farm Biogas in Delaware. So can you tell us about how greenwashing is happening with factory farm biogas, not only in Delaware, but across the country? Sure, thanks Rebecca. So as you said, um, the, this, this tactic of greenwashing the factory farm production model is becoming uh, more and more common throughout the country. And we're seeing the largest, most harmful factory farming players uh, point to anaerobic digesters as a supposed solution, primarily to the enormous quantities of waste that these facilities generate, and also to their climate impacts. So the greenhouse gas emissions associated with how they uh, produce their products. So I know I'm gonna have an opportunity later in our talk here to talk a little bit more about what exactly a digester is, but um, very briefly, you know, a digester is uh, a, a containment facility that brings in a waste stream and then creates a certain environment that allows microbes to break down parts of that waste. And as part of, as those microbes essentially eat that waste, they emit gases, so biogas. And that biogas is collected by the digester and then can be, then be used for a variety of purposes. It can be refined or it can be burned in a generator on site, et cetera. So, you know, one thing that's really critical about why this is greenwashing and why the industry narrative about the adoption of digesters is, is uh, misleading to folks as they hear about it is because it does not eliminate pollution and it does not eliminate the waste streams that go into the digesters. So you'll typically hear digesters talked about as though you have this large quantity of waste that's introduced to a digester and out the other side comes, you know, organic flowers and renewable natural gas. And that's just simply not the full picture. The waste that goes in still has to be managed on the other side. What happens in the digester is the generation and collection of gas, right? which does not eliminate the waste stream. So at the end of the day, there is still a huge amount of pollution laden waste that has to be managed. And you know, the other really important and critical feature here is that digesters as proposed, especially with this project, and you mentioned the connection with Purdue, is fundamentally dependent on the perpetuation and really the expansion of the factory farm production model. And so digesters only make sense when you are committed to the baseline that we will be suffering with huge harmful factory farms essentially forever, for decades to come, okay? okay. So that's the baseline that they're operating off of. Right. Thank you, Tyler. I'm gonna to turn to Maria to give us an overview as well. Um, Maria, you have a personal connection and parts of what Tyler bring up to this fight and more broadly, you know, all of this work. Someone actually who RSVP'd for this event wrote to us that they are appreciative of this webinar and interested in learning more because they have four chicken factory farms in their county alone, two of which are between two and a half and three and a half million birds. So can you tell us some of your story and how you became a regional representative for SRAP living in Delaware? Sure, so um, I was living directly across the street from um, an industrialized factory farm. And um, when we had bought the property, it was um, cows on pasture and life was good. And we lived in a farming community and that's what we wanted. When the property was sold, somebody with um, connections to um, agribusiness decided to start building poultry houses, um, cattle feedlot. <laughs> and then that opened the door to uh, swine capos up the street. Um, but we were directly across the street from these operations. And um, what 
we ended up doing was basically abandoning our house, closing our business and leaving because the health of our family was being destroyed daily um, from rashes, MRSA, um, eyes burning, throat burning. Um, I was running my eight year old to the doctor at eight years old for tightness in the chest with the breathing. Um, there were problems of uh, mass mortalities. Um, there was 20,000 birds that died in the middle of summer. And after that, I was bathing my child and bringing him out with palm-sized blisters all over his body and rushing him to emergency. Um, when you're talking about industrialized operations, um, there's VOCs, there are harmful gases, ammonia, um, and what happens is your family's health deteriorates quickly, um, as well as the environment. Um, I can remember instances where my child would get off of the bus, um, the school bus, and literally vomit because the odors in the air were that bad. And that got me thinking, you know, if a person drinks too much alcohol and there's a toxin, your body tries to get rid of it to, you know, expel it. And even when I would drive out of my driveway in the morning, there would be a film from all the dust because a lot of the poultry operations, one of their main um, emissions is this dust and the dander. And I would have to put my windshield wipers on just to come out of the driveway. And I would see this film and think, when I'm breathing, this is going in my lungs if it's going on the windshield of my car and I can't see. Um, it got to the point where we didn't have any choice. There were times I was dizzy inside my house calling 911. Um, it, it was just a nightmare. And what I will say is that the communities that we work with all experience this on some level. And it is um, pretty well known that these are placed and often built by design in unincorporated areas in areas that are uh, what we call environmental justice communities, vulnerable communities, uh, minorities, um, poor, the elderly, people with health conditions. And it is by design. Um, unfortunately, um, when you're in that position, there's not much to do except for to leave because often what I've seen in um, every state I've worked in is that there is not good enforcement once they come in. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's, it's helpful to, um, for everyone to hear really how, how this experience really impacts or how these facilities really impact people on a personal level. And anyone who has the pleasure to know you knows that you are a force to be reckoned with. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think I can pass it to Carrie to then say um, a little bit more about her vision. I think in a positive sense, Carrie, you have a really robust vision for Delawareans um, in your work as an organizer and advocate. How do you see the expansion of factory farms and biogas really connect to that broader fight for justice in Delaware and for your fellow Americans? Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately, Maria's story isn't um, Delaware centric. It's not even centered on uh, environmental justice. It's the story of people who are forgotten, who don't have the, um, the dollars in their pockets to, to buy political capital. They don't have uh, the jobs that make people say, oh, they're worthy of being heard. And so time and time again, we realize that government economic planning often fails to consider the, the economics of poverty. And, and when I say poverty, we have to we have to understand that we all are in it. It's not the government's definition of poverty, right? Which is like a family of four but below twenty thousand dollars or something ridiculous. Um, it's the fact that four out of five of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That's regardless of income. That's regardless of race. That's regardless of the actual career you're in or zip code. Four out of five of us are living paycheck to paycheck. And if you don't define that as poverty, if you don't define that as uh, indentured servitude, then you're missing the, the idea that our struggles are connected. 
And um, all too often, uh, large corporations convince legislators that it's in the best interest of the community to expand their operations. We'll bring jobs, right? In the case of this biogas um, facility, there's going to be a handful of jobs. Well, if you live in Sussex County right now, you know that we don't have enough quality jobs. But I ask you, do you want those jobs to risk your health, right? We know that already we have a quality of water that is so low that we worry about bathing our children, letting them drink the water. Uh, is it causing the spike in, um, in learning disabilities that we're seeing in certain parts of Sussex? We have to, we have to ask, ask these questions and they're valid questions. And we have to then say to our government officials, we have to say to large corporations, enough is enough. Stop creating revenue on our shoulders. Stop making it so that your economic gains come at our despair, right? Whether it's for us as individuals or as a community, we do not deserve such treatment. And we are wising up to the fact that uh, time and time again, you fed us these lies and we keep falling through the cracks. Um, and so again, this is no different than any of the other issues we see. And we see it time and time again, that communities of color, regardless of income level and low income white people are usually the targets. We are the kicking dog, right? Of the community. And there is the excuse because they expect us not to have the capital. But I promise you, like every other issue, if we come together, we will have success and we will make it clear that you can't make it without us and that we will no longer take um, the, the abuse of industry. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I want to pause actually before we get into the specifics and, and after you all really introduced us, because it is really, really critical that we make our voices heard on this. We're going to talk more about this in later questions that we got about this project specifically. But last year, as we mentioned, the Sussex County Planning and Zoning Commission was prepared to rubber stamp this project without any public engagement, without the proper permits. And our coalition stopped them. We worked together to stop them. But now we really need everyone engaged on this. Throughout tonight, I'm gonna to be dropping the link. I'm gonna start here. My colleague Jolene will drop the link in the chat. Um, you can write your pub public comment. And while the commission has not opened this for public comment yet, we anticipate that they will on February 11th. So we need to be prepared and we're getting prepared tonight. So I'm gonna to transition to talk specifically about the project with everyone. Um, Tyler, let's turn our next section of questions to you, um, starting with you. So we're gonna get into these specifics with this, this facility in Sussex County. Tyler, can you explain, I think you did a little bit at the top what anaerobic digestion is, but exactly um, with this proposed pipe project from beginning to end, what does, that, what does it entail that we know of so far? So the project that's being proposed would be four large anaerobic digesters several other holding tanks and treatment facilities and a whole lot of other uh, infrastructure needed to operate those digesters. And I'll start with the digesters and then we can talk about sort of what happens with the gas after it's collected. You know, this is a unique project. Most of the other anaerobic digester facilities that exist in the United States use manure from cow and pig operations. Digesters can operate off of a whole variety of other what are, what's called feedstock, so it can operate off of food waste and all sorts of things, but we're focused on factory farm biogas here tonight. This facility, in contrast, will operate off of waste from the poultry industry. And last I checked, there are only two other anaerobic digesters of this scale in the entire country that run off poultry waste. And so what that, what that entails um, is produce uh, wastewater stream from its processing facilities. So the, the blood and the, the gore that comes out of the slaughter process. Poultry litter from the contract uh, chicken raising houses, which is manure and urine and mortalities and litter, which is a dry material, wood chips, sawdust, things like that, as well as waste from poultry hatcheries. Okay. And so one of the critical features of why I raised this is because uh, poultry litter, which I think we can expect will be the majority of the waste that goes into the digesters, is not at all suitable for anaerobic digestion in its, its, I guess I'll say raw state as it comes from the farm. 
that has to be liquefied when it arrives on site. So the poultry litter will come from chicken factory farms. It will arrive on site. And then bioenergy will have to pump enormous amounts of fresh water out of the ground and liquefy it. Uh, the estimates are around 4,000 gallons of fresh water are needed for every single ton of poultry litter in order, before it's suitable for digestion. And again, this facility is uh, being advertised as being able to take in 200,000 tons of waste a year. So you can do the math. That is an enormous amount of fresh water resource that we're talking about. The other challenging aspect is just technical. Uh, poultry litter is chemically different than other feedstocks that are typically used. And so it can be very high in ammonia and other things that are actually fatal to the digestion process, making this uh, frankly a risky and, and novel proposal um, that I think should have folks worried about its viability, both economically and just technically and from a public safety perspective. And so supposing everything goes okay and digestion occurs appropriately and biogas is generated, um, again, the pollution involved remains there to be managed. So after that biogas is generated, uh, digestate or effluent comes out the other end. And that's typically separated into solid digestate and liquid digestate. Um, you know, one of the, I think the talking points from this developer is that they're gonna help manage the waste that already exists in the Delmarva, right? This is just, we already have this waste problem. And so our facility is going to help manage that. But because of the liquefaction process, they're gonna start with you know, X tons of waste and they're gonna amplify that dramatically. And now they're gonna end up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of polluted wastewater that has to be managed, right? So this is creating more waste simply so that this company can make money off selling biogas. So in addition to that digester process, this facility would include an upgrading or a refining facility. So they would take the biomethane, or I'm sorry, the biogas and turn it into biomethane so that they can then sell it to utilities and inject it into the regional natural gas pipeline, okay? And so, you know, one way to think about that is it's like having an oil refinery in your backyard. That's essentially what we're talking about here. This is a highly industrialized gas production facility, okay? This is not agriculture. Um, you know, and as a part of that, we're also talking about propping up and expanding the dirty natural gas pipeline infrastructure. So this biomethane feeds into the regional grid and is mixed in with fossil natural gas. So one of the biggest challenges we have right now as a society is getting off our addiction to fossil fuels to avoid climate chaos. And what this project would do is lock in that infrastructure and ensure continued reliance on not only biomethane, but fossil fuels. So fossil methane, right? And that comes with leakage all throughout the delivery chain. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's completely accepted that the biomethane would not be replacing fossil natural gas in any meaningful amount, right? So it's critical to recognize that this is um, greenwashing both the factory farm problems as well as an opportunity for natural gas purveyors to greenwash their operations by saying that we're using biomethane. Thank you, Tyler. I think it's important for, it's, it's, it's specific, there's a lot going on here, but I think it's important for everyone to really see that the technical side of things and understand it because that it's very veiled, it's a very veiled process. So some illumination, illumination there, but um, aside from all those specifics, I think it's pretty clear that factory farm biogas and this is this is attempt to keep business as usual and keep expanding the industry. So Maria, I think we've been touching on this a little bit, but you're you're an expert in the area. What does a project like this mean for our air and water? So um, Tyler touched a little bit with the emissions. Um, we have to consider and this is something I don't think I probably need to remind anybody that is from Delaware and watching right now. 90% of our waterways are polluted in Delaware. Again, 90% of our waterways in Delaware are polluted. As uh, a matter of fact, I think I got an email this morning about um, $50 million investment needed to clean up that they're trying to get by again this year. Um, this project 
I want everyone to understand this is not just Delaware waste. This project is proposing to take in the waste from the tri-state region into Sussex County. Delaware cannot seem to manage their own waste with this industry as 90% of our waterways are contaminated. Um, this is not a solution. This is going to bring more waste that we need to manage that we cannot seem to do. Um, and what I want folks to understand is this does not stop the land application process and runoff. There is an end product a byproduct. That byproduct is going to go into the composting from the industry, what they have put out and through their application. Um, the composting needs to be land applied. So now we have a tri-state region that we need to land apply this compost. Um, I want to remind people that in the introduction, Rebecca said that this was a failed compost operation. This operation here, it would be a 20 year um, contract with Devco and Purdue. Purdue in 2019 received a secretary's order with their compost. And uh, the third violation was Purdue knowingly engaged in improper solid waste handling and disposal practices in violation of permit condition three, A in section 1.0 of the regulations governing solid waste by permitting waste in the form of unfinished compost containing, everyone listen, this is what was in the compost coming out of there, excessive fecal bacteria and chromium six to be sold or distributed for the purpose of land application. Now, for those who may not know what chromium-6 is, if you remember the movie Aaron Brockovich, that was chromium-6. Um, these are cancer-causing agents. Um, this is not something that is um, an organic solution. This is a byproduct of waste coming in from three states. So we need to keep our eye on the ball and realize um, it's not all lollipops and rainbows the way that it's being sold to the public. Um, be smart and let's ask the right questions because um, this will, it's a 20 year contract. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about renewable energy, uh, just because it's recycled doesn't mean it's green. And um, we need to be smart about what we're opening the door for. I think Rebecca, yeah. maybe just add a, a couple quick things Please. to that because Maria made some really excellent points that I feel like I was remiss in not mentioning in, in when, when I was talking. Um, I mean, she's spot on with everything she said. And with respect to the composting facility, it's important to note that this uh, new owner is actually has requested to up the total quantity of compost that it's allowed to handle and deliver. And one of the challenges with the previous site was that Purdue could never find an adequate market to sell its compost. And yet now the proposal is to create more compost, which as Maria said, is gonna to have to be land applied or disposed of in some other way, right? And so that just like doesn't make economic sense. Um, and also, you know, digesters have the effect of concentrating pollutants in what comes out the other end. So it's not just that waste goes in and waste comes out. The waste that comes out the other side can be significantly more harmful to water quality, soil health, and, and, and community health than what we started with, right? I think that's important to note as well. Yeah, and I was gonna just have a follow-up question kind of around this question, maybe for both of you or whoever wants to answer, but, but why are places like this allowed right near where people live? Like, I think that's something that people don't know or understand kind of about, about zoning. So um, I'm going to take this a little bit because I want to uh, go into something that Tyler was talking about when we're talking about compost. Um, this idea has been sold many times in Delaware. Um, for those familiar, Wilmington had a compost facility peninsula, which was shut down because of the problems. 
um, for many who are familiar here in Sussex County, uh, Blessings Blends has been an operation that has uh, been nonstop for over a decade with problems with the neighbors. I just read the secretary's order on this site. Um, we have to stop looking at Delaware as though we are the toilet bowl for the peninsula, um, for the tri-state region, for this kind of waste. We are better than that. Um, we feel that we should be investing truly in renewables, mm -hmm. um, in good jobs. This is a lot of temporary jobs, but we have to get to the point where um, this, this is not something that is going to be good for our communities. When we talk about zoning, zoning is supposed to be done for harmony, right? You put things where they belong to make sense. This area is an agricultural residential area, um, which means farming, which means homes, communities. Near this facility, uh, I took a ride out there, gosh, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. Um, you have uh, mobile home parks, a half mile, a mile. Um, these people are on uh, well water, many of them. Right. And one of the things that zoning is supposed to take into account is the safety, um, the health of the community. When we're talking about this type of an operation, it's highly industrialized. Um, think about refineries and uh, things like that. This, there's um, cause to be concerned about explosion, about, as we mentioned, emissions. Um, this is not where this belongs in an ag residential community. That's why it's going to come under a conditional use. The other thing that I want folks to concentrate on when we're talking about waste 24 seven coming from three states, uh, where's the traffic impact study? Okay, there was no traffic impact study done. Um, quickly, I'm going to uh, read. They had tried to get this through as an amendment without any type of public process. And I just wanna read the, the one paragraph out of uh, this amendment, I mean, out of the uh, amendment they were trying to pass this on originally. It says, our volume-based criteria for requiring a traffic impact study, and it goes through the section, are that a development of more than 500 trips per day or 50 trips during a weekly peak hour. While it seems that that above criteria could be met we presently cannot predict the site's trip generation with enough accuracy to make a traffic impact study useful. Mm. Thus, we up. recommend that this rezoning application be considered without a traffic impact study and that the need be evaluated when a subdivision or land development plan is proposed. Now, anybody that lives down here knows the problems with traffic. If you feel like an operation that is going to take in waste 24 seven from three states doesn't need a TIS, I suggest everybody put that as their first comment in the box for the hearing. Lots of comments, that's right. Yes. Awesome, well, thank you. I think, I think so we have a sense of exactly kind of what's going on with the company, um, but what's going on, Carrie, when you heard about this project, you got on the ground, started knocking doors and talking to people interested, we kind of are hearing the inner workings of what's going on, what's not adding up right, but what are you hearing from people? Um, so we're hearing a few things that you would expect. So one is um, people had no idea, right? right? They're just living their lives. We know that, um, you know, to piggyback off of um, what, what Maria said, uh, this is an agricultural community, right? And so those of you who are listening who live in rural communities, you know that it's, you're either ag or you are tend to be living in poverty. So um, they're selecting these places because they feel that people have uh, low political capital, as I mentioned before, and or they're overworked. And so they don't have time to pay attention until it's too late. 
right? And that's what they're betting on. Um, and so the, the concern that we need to have um, is that the people aren't hearing from us. We need to show up and knock on doors and, and that's what's happening and that's what I've done. And so either people don't know or they know and they feel like they can't do anything about it. If by chance you're one of those folks and I convince you to be on this call, um, know that you can, right? It, you're considered to have low political capital, but the truth is uh, in all places, but especially a state this size, um, elections are won by a handful of votes, literally. Um, three, four, five votes have won state general assembly positions, right? Local, local offices and so on. And so these are the people who are making decisions, thinking you're not paying attention, thinking that you don't believe you have power, but you do. Um, and this is something that we have to do when we're knocking on the doors is remind people of that. We have to let them know that uh, they have a coalition. And for those of you who are on the line who do know you have political capital, it is incumbent upon you to use it uh, as leverage for folks who just can't, whether they're too busy or they don't know their own power yet. Uh, and then also to understand this, um, we were having a conversation the other day and uh, Tyler earlier mentioned how, how this issue, how this biogas facility is so highly explosive, right? This potential for explosion is real. And um, we kind of got wonky on it. And I said, well, we, we have to explain it in terms that people get, right? Because uh, here's the hard fact. Would you move next door? Or would you let a meth lab be built right next door to you, right? Even if they said they were gonna employ some folks in the community to create that meth, and they told you that it was going to help with mental health needs, right? Because somebody was healing themselves with meth. Uh, but they forgot to tell you that it was highly addictive and that it eventually could kill someone. And they've also forgot to tell you that while they were making this drug, that at any point, this house could explode. Would you say it was okay? Would you say it was worth that handful of jobs? Would you say it would, was worth the health of your family member who they are saying uh, this could actually help, right? We have learned over and over and over again that big industry tells us whatever they think is the buzz thing to say so that they can make profits. And it's happening right now. They are right now saying this is green. Why? Because all of us realize that our environment needs our help and we have to do things to fix it. But this is not the answer. It's the same things that they were telling people in other regions, dealing with other forms of quote unquote green energy that ended up killing people. And this is going to also happen. You might not die today, but long term, there are going to be effects. And so getting into the communities, letting them know what really will happen, expanding out to other areas that have political capital, letting them know the impact is going to be important. And even more important, as for folks who are saying, well, I'm not really worried, even if it explodes, I'm far away. If people are saying, well, I won't be in impacted by the traffic because I live in Newcastle County. Um, know this, especially if you live in the state of Delaware, we all depend on the beach economy to run our state. If this biogas facility comes to be becomes a reality and we pollute our waterways even more so than they are polluted now, it will impact our economy because people will learn that it is unsafe to swim in Delaware waters. And we cannot take that chance. We never could, and most certainly we can't take it coming out of COVID when we are all impacted in, uh, economically. So you must step up. You must say that this is not okay. There is no excuse. Uh, it's a health hazard. It's morally in, uh, inexcusable. And it is economically irresponsible to put something that could injure a whole other industry that we know we can depend on. Thank you, Carrie. We were just queuing up. I think we, we were talking about the, you're talking about how the industry is like crafting their narrative and how they want to tell this story. And we are seeing that from their flyers. So we were just queuing up to just show briefly the have your cake and eat it too flyer. And, and they're talking about this being some great thing for environmental justice as well, which we know is the direct opposite. So um, sorry, Josie, I queued you too early, but if, if you want to share that quickly, we can share kind of exactly what the industry is saying. And this is the industry, um, their little literal pamphlet, this first one saying, AKA having your, your cake and eating it too. And obviously we're, we're here to shed light on that. That is not true. And then at the last slide, Jolene, if you share that piece too, 
Just well, the, the, ir the irony of that comment, though, is uh, <laughs> if, you, if you are a student of history and Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat cake. Right, right, uh, right. right. <laughs> right, the ashes of 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 the oven. Um, I don't I don't want I don't want doo doo in my cake. Right, right? Uh, Jolene, can you share the the last slide as well too? All the way at the end. There's just a lot of um, of narrative here that obviously we're sharing is incorrect of what the facility would actually do. I don't know if it went down to that last slide. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Right. So there you go. Becca, I want I want to add just a little bit in here. You know, um, this slide really offended me because anybody that knows me knows that um, I I care about these communities. Right. I care about the vulnerable and. Um, to me, this is appalling to try to uh, basically present this as a solution for um, communities that are vulnerable and experiencing industrialized pollution. And one of the, well, two things come in mind. Um, for those who have been following this nationally, North Carolina is experiencing and the communities there, just like our communities here and our EJ communities. Um, have been going through this for a long time. This is not a solution. Second thing I will talk about just quickly is the area there by Seaford. Okay, there is a super fun site, um, eh, a little over about two miles away mm -hmm. that we just had national publicity on, right? Where the National Guard was in handing out water. I looked on EWG and Vinyl Working Group at the groundwater there. Right now, there is there are 10 contaminants, 10 pollutants that are above the health levels. All of them, um, the effects are cancer causing, potentially cancer causing. Delaware leads in cancer. It's from bad decisions and opening our doors to things like this. And it's appalling to me that they're trying to sell it this way. Thanks, Maria. Can I actually, I'm going to add a couple things to that, and I would love if we could pull up, uh, I believe it was slide three and what I saw there, but, um, you know, the other thing, Maria, that I think is critical that, that dovetails with what you were just saying is that, you know, this site is essentially surrounded by wetlands, mm -hmm. particularly vulnerable ecosystems, right? And the gum branch of the Nanticoke River, where this site is located, is already severely overburdened with pollution. The state is actually mandated to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus in that watershed uh, by 50 and 30 percent, respectively. Right. So we're talking about an area that's already imperiled. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry. Yeah, that that slide number three, I think, was just was a, a very perfect uh, example of how this developer is talking about their project. And that's okay if you can't bring it up. Essentially, it's a little flow chart that um, kind of goes to what I was saying, I think at the beginning of our talk here, um, where it has waste on one end. Yeah, perfect. Waste on one end, anaerobic digestion in the middle, and then out the other side comes renewable energy and organic soil amendments. Hmm. There are many legs at that right side that are being left out. One is the enormous amount of polluted wastewater they're gonna generate, which this is one of the transparency pieces. They have failed to provide any explanation as to what they're going to do with that enormous amounts of wastewater that they're proposing to generate. It doesn't show the truck bombs. In other words, trucks carrying explosive gases right. off the site and through neighborhoods. It doesn't show the greenhouse gas emissions that they are creating. Keep in mind that the methane that would come out of this facility would not exist but for this digester facility, okay? So poultry litter is typically land applied dry and doesn't, unless it's mismanaged, does not create greenhouse gas emissions on the scale that it will with this facility. So just wanted to flag the, the uh, patently misleading nature of uh, an illustration like this that's being put out to the community. Thank you, Tyler. 
So I think we did actually touch on, I have next, there've been so many questions that folks wrote in. Um, there's a lot of questions and obviously as we're, as we're revealing here, there's a lot of veil around this project here in, in Delaware, but also around the country we're seeing. I've been tracking trends over the last um, year and a half on biogas, um, biogas across the country. And we're seeing this more and more, but this is a particularly big facility and one that we're really paying attention to because again, it could set the stage for the rest of development across the country. It's, it's critically important. So we talked a little bit about water. I really wanna to get to some of the transparency and the issues around county council and the county commission. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take us to that next. Um, and I wanna, again, pause to remind everyone that the Sussex County Planning and Zoning Commission will now open this project for public comment. We're expecting it to be February 11th. So we're gonna drop, and that's like in a week, a week and a half. So we're gonna drop that um, action in the chat right now. And again, on our Facebook Live, you can, if you're in Delaware, you can take action on this, submit your public comment. We're gonna collect them and help submit them. So get, get, get started on that. Um, if we really need to get prepared for that. But also if you are not in Delaware and you wanna stay up um, on these issues and stay involved and kind of learn what's going on maybe in your area about biogas. We're also gonna drop a link um, if you're not in Delaware to stay on our list and we can give you updates that way as well. So I just wanted to, to pause and say that one more time. Um, we are going to now transition to talk about the transparency around this issue. I know we're running up to about 12 minutes and there's a ton there. So I'm gonna have our, my speakers bounce off of each other, um, but it is in incredibly important to engage now. So please, 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 you're not ready to write it right this moment because you're listening to us, um, just save that link because it's really important that you submit your public comment today or very soon. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start with you, Maria. Again, we have like about 12 minutes. So I wanna kind of get us through here. And I know there are folks asking questions as well. We're gonna, I'm gonna collect those and make sure that we get back to people. So keep asking those questions. Hopefully we're addressing them. But Maria, can you talk about the county's efforts to rubber stamp this scheme at the end of last year? And again, why it is so critical that folks get in, engaged on this now. Yeah, so we kind of found out about this looking through um, Sussex County, what was you know coming up on the various agendas. And there was a project that was listed um, as a revised project, I believe. And um, revised site plan. They weren't site even- Site plan, revised site plan, yes. Yeah, so, when I went in to see what it was, I was horrified <laughs> to see that this was an amendment that they were trying to do this, this humongous industrialized project um, as an amendment to the 2013 compost um, conditional use, as an amendment to it. Why were they doing it that way? Because guess what that knocked out? public process, right? This way, nobody could comment on it. Now, interestingly, if you go through the documents, um, part of that conditional use said specifically that any alteration to these site plans would have to go in front of the county as a public process. Well, our illustrious county decided, I guess they didn't know how to read that line. I'm not quite sure but they decided to amend it and try to pass this. Um, thankfully, enough people and enough organizations were concerned about them trying to bypass the public process that they signed on and with pressure, um, the county pulled it off of the agenda. And now it will come under a conditional use the way that it should a project of this scale. This is not an amendment. This is um, a massive industrialized project. And one of the things I believe in is um, part of the democratic process is that citizens get to weigh in on things that will impact them. So it's an important part of the process. And um, as Rebecca said, February 11th, it will be coming um, under PNZ, you can go online. Um, they will also be having the hearing at a larger facility that they've been using for um, right. some of the, the uh, hearings that they feel will have a greater response, so that will be there. But again, this is our opportunity um, to shape our county. 
So I encourage everyone to shape it. <laughs> right. If I may, Rebecca, just quickly, I think this is really important, you know, as we uh, tell people that they need to engage with this upcoming uh, zoning and planning commission hearing, planning and zoning commission, um, you know, while, while Maria is, is accurate and, and correct that um, they are requiring them, requiring this developer to submit an, a new application, right, which triggers public hearings and what have you, which was the process they were, they were trying to avoid suspiciously. Um, what they are proposing now is still woefully inadequate. So these are called conditional uses because you put conditions on the use to protect the community, like Maria was describing in an agriculture residential area. The document that the county council put out on the 12th of this month, which is essentially the conditional use that's going to go up before the commission on the 11th, has no conditions. No additional protections will be involved over and above what they felt was necessary for an open air composting facility back in 2013. So while they're, they're following the appropriate process, the substance is woefully lacking and needs to be on the front of folks' minds. And it's something that, that people have to raise at the hearing um, because they're still trying to pretend as though a gas production facility is just a composting site. Um, and they're really just trying to check a box by having a hearing um, in which your voice won't actually be heard and protections will not actually be considered. So I think that's really important for folks to recognize as we get closer. Right, thank you, Tyler. Um, I was, so as we're talking about kind of the, the suspicious activity here, I wanted to turn to Carrie because um, actually when we opened this up and people were asking questions of our panel and that's how we, we structured this evening to, to give you all of this feedback um, and kind of share and unveil what's going on. We didn't receive a question, we received a comment. And the, the, the comment was our county commissioners are all about big business and revenue at any cost. So, you know, Carrie, my question then is what, what should the role of local government be here? Yeah, um, whoever submitted that comment, uh, thank you. Um, a lot of people feel it, but they don't say it. And um, we need to start holding our elected officials accountable. Their job is to make sure that we have a strong, vibrant economy, right? So I don't want to discount that. However, it shouldn't mean that they um, they are willing to bet your your health. It shouldn't mean that they should be willing to bet the um, property values of your homes. It doesn't mean that they should only consider their um, the nice things they get from big industry, like the parties they get to go to, or the dinners they get to have, or the uh, events that they put on for you, but it's paid for by these big industries, right? Um, things that will get them reelected. They need to know that they will get reelected by doing the right things, right? And so part of government transparency comes down to making sure that they are giving the true information necessary, right? You as the voter, you as the constituent should be given all angles of the story so you can determine what's best for you, right? There might be somebody out there that says, I don't care, I want biogas, right? I don't agree with you, but at least you can say you've been educated on the pros and the cons, right? And truth, but you haven't heard the true pros, right? Because they've been making it up. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot more cons to biogas. And so what we need from our elected officials is to make sure that, yes, they make they tell us that they're having a hearing because by law, they have to tell you seven days in advance. But that's not really enough for you to find out what's going on, to do the research when you're a busy person. You're taking care of your family. You're going to and from work. You're trying to plan for your future, right? Also, there is technically no requirement to post it anywhere online. They could just put it on a door and you might go back by that building, you might not. But when was the last time you stopped by a public building? So they need to put it in places that are accessible to the public and they need to put it in language that we understand, right? Um, Maria and I were talking one day and she said TIS and I said, that's great, we know what it is. But if another person doesn't know what a traffic impact study is, um, that's a problem. Right. And if they put that type of information in the public announcement, 
you'll pass it over if that's not something you already understand. And so part of transparency is to assume that not all of us know exactly what the government is doing and their job as government is to break it down so that we do understand, so that nothing is happening in the still of the night. And once that happens, there is trust. And so um, the way we can force transparency is to make it clear that when they try to push through things like this, like zoning permits, um, uh, that we will hold them accountable. It's not good enough. In the state of Delaware, I say all the time, you know, we let people get away with getting reelected because they have a firm handshake, a soft smile and remembered our, our child's name. That's not enough, right? It's not enough. They can be nice. You can invite them to the cookout, but they shouldn't be making the rules for your life. They shouldn't be making the legislation. They shouldn't be determining what happens next if they are led by the wrong things, right? And so uh, transparency starts with us holding them accountable and requiring that they do more than what is in the statute, but they go above and beyond. Uh, you don't get a cookie just for doing your job, right? You get a cookie because you did a little bit more. And so um, we need to have that expectation. And if they don't do it, then there are consequences. Thank you, Carrie. I'm on fire with all the analogies. I love it. Um, and also just again, highlighting, we organized to make this democracy, you know, to make this a piece of democracy here. So please remember to, you know, take down what we are putting in the chat to get ready to submit your public comment. Again, February 11th, it is so, so, so important um, that, you know, we, we stay on this. And I know we're kind of closing up with time here. There's so many questions or other things about water. We're gonna, we're gonna keep the conversation going. We're gonna keep our lines open to be talking to you. But we, I do want to, because we're almost to the hour, um, go through the next steps of what's going to happen. And I have this final question here for Tyler, but but everyone please chime in if, you know, we'll, we'll get to the end here together. The question that actually someone wrote in, which is good to just address what the next steps are here is, have the necessary permits already been secured from DENREC, which is the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. So it's like the state agency that would govern the permits here. Have those permits already been secured um, to operate this facility? So Tyler, Maybe you can answer that and get us started on next steps. Uh, no, the DENREC permits have not been issued. And so what we have before us right now is the local zoning decision, which right. will go before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And then they will send a recommendation to the county council, which is your body of elected officials. And then the county council will have the final say, and there will be another public hearing then about this proposal. Okay, so those are the two steps at the local level. Once that has happened, if the county approves this, uh, which it shouldn't because this is not an appropriate use in this area, um, then DENREC would consider the slew of applications that have already been put in for the permits they're going to need because, again, this is an industrial facility with huge risks. And so there are several water, air, soil, and uh, solid waste permits that will be required. And those will also come with public hearings and an opportunity to engage. Thank but that's you. an if, it all depends on what the county does. Thank you. Maria and Carrie, did we miss anything there? Next steps as we get organized, we stay organized. Um, I just want to add one final comment. Uh, sunlight is always the best disinfectant. And if a project is this good, there should have been transparency from the beginning because it would be able to sell itself. Um, we would like to thank now the community outreach person that's emailing folks now for transparency. It's a nice afterthought. It would have been nicer before so that the public could have actually participated. Um, so we encourage everyone now, um, thank you for weighing in because it was your voices that caused this to go through the public process now. Mm -hmm. um, so use your voices, they're important. Thank you, Maria. That's a, that's a perfect end. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank everyone who joined and our speakers who took us through each of the different pieces of what's going on here, how we're organizing, how, um, you know, how we're shining light on what's going on with the permitting process as well. Um, I know there are a lot of questions. There are some, some more here. I'm going to take those down and make sure I'm getting back to people, work to address them with this team here. Um, and if you're not in Delaware, again, um, we have a link to join our list and, and figure out what's going on in your area too, because again, this is setting the stage for what's happening across the country. So it's good to be 
um, involved and, and, and stay up to date on what's going on both in your area and, and with this project. So again, thank you all for joining us tonight. We will be in touch. We'll talk soon and stay well and be safe. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.